everyone. We'd like to welcome you, welcome you to our seedlings program tonight. Um, as we begin this event, we acknowledge that we are presenting from Providence, Rhode Island, a small portion of the traditional homelands of the Narragansett and Wampanoag peoples. And collectively, we support the return of indigenous seeds to their rightful stewards. Uh, my name is Amy Fontaine. I'm the library supervisor of the Rochambeau Library at Providence Community Library. My colleagues and the co-organizers of Seedlings are here as well, Lee Smith, Adult Services Librarian at PCL's Mount Pleasant Library, and Fatima Maswood, an ecological landscape designer, educator, and artist. Additionally, we would like to thank our collaborators on this project, uh, Vanessa Venturini and the URI Master Gardeners, and Summer Gonzalez of the Brown University Superfund Research Program. All right, so on behalf of all of us, we would like to welcome back Susan Scotty for part two of her workshop. Uh, Susan is a University of Rhode Island Master Gardener who um, is joining us this evening to present on indoor seed starting. Tonight, Sue will teach us tips and tricks for direct sowing and transplanting seedlings into our outdoor vegetable garden, including timing, spacing, watering, and more. Um, Sue has been a master gardener since 2004 and has led the vegetable greenhouse teams for over 15 years. Her passion for helping others has led to her role in harvesting at the demo gardens, as well as training and ensuring food safety. She has been teaching since 2004 and her main class topics are seed starting, transplanting and food safety in the garden. Um, so we ask that for the duration of the presentation, um, you keep yourself on mute. As always, our presenter will be happy to take questions at the end of the presentation, uh, but feel free to type your questions into the chat as they arise throughout the program. That way you won't forget. Uh, closed captioning is available if you click the button uh, at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, so for more information on the Providence Seed Library that um, is running at four of the PCL locations, Rochambeau Library, Mount Pleasant Library, Knight Memorial Library, and Washington Park Library. Um, Fatima will put some links into the chat uh, so that you can find out more about what that program is. Um, has uh, has to offer. So I'm gonna stop now. Welcome Sue, take it away. Hi, nice to see you, nice to be back. All right, so we're gonna be doing seed starting and transplanting outdoors. Um, so I work with the URI Master Gardeners. We're part of the Cooperative Extension with URI, bringing science-based university resources to Rhode Island's peoples and communities since 1914. And some of the resources that are available to you, just go over them at the beginning, I think they're going to put them in the chat too, is the UR Master Gardener's Gardening Resources um, website, um, which will give you lots of information, some of which I'll be talking about today, so you'll know where to get the charts, um, as well as our hotline, and that's our hotline number, as well as the email. The hotline is now live again for the first time in two years. Um, and they do have people answering in the evenings as well. And if, uh, and if it's late at night and they're not there, you can leave them a message. All right, so today we're gonna to be talking about uh, seed starting and transplanting outdoors. We're gonna talk about preparing the garden, its basic needs, planning it, soil preparation and watering considerations. We're gonna go over potting up your seed starts, um, direct sowing into the garden and transplanting the seedlings into the garden. So the basic needs of your garden, it needs six hours of direct sunlight or more, <laughs> more is better. Vegetables love lots of light. Um, outside of the root zones of trees, because that's really competitors. Uh, not only do the trees make shade, um, but you have to remember that as big as the leaves are, you also have the roots that come out about the same. Um, so you don't wanna be planting on top. It's just uh, competing with, uh, for nutrients and for water. Try to stay at least 10 feet away from buildings, um, just in case there's any lead paint or anything like that that may be coming off the buildings. Um, and you'd never want to plant over your septic system. I know they say the grass is always greener, but let it just be grass um, and not your vegetables, um, because it can have pathogens that can come up through the soil, um, particularly if you have any kind of septic leach or over your leach field. Don't do that either. Um, protection from strong winds as you know your vegetable seedlings although you might be caging them up and all that kind of stuff um, you still want to protect them as best they can you don't want them blowing over um, and breaking off because then you've done all this work and you don't end up with your vegetables um, you want well-drained soil don't want to have a swamp 
want it to have a uh, good drainage, want it to have a nice feel to it. You want it to not be totally compact and you want it to be fairly level. Um, you think of it, if water goes to the, to make it level, right? So if you're watering on one end and it's going downhill, the things at the bottom are gonna be overwatered and the things at the top are gonna be too dry. So where is the sun? Take a look at your spot. Are you, are you east facing? Do you get a little, my garden is face so it gets morning sun and then it also gets some afternoon sun and then some of it's under the trees. So where is the sun in your spot? Where is the water? How far do you have to walk? Are you going to be bringing in hoses? Are you going to be using watering cans? Um, where is your water source? Um, nearby trees and buildings again. Um, and think about your sowing sequence. Like uh, if I plant peas now, um, what can I plant in there after? What can I plant um, later? And we'll just, you can kind of figure out in your garden plan uh, what sort of things you're gonna do to have as much um, success as possible. And then the plant heights. So a lot of times this is one that people forget about is that your tomatoes that you're planting and they're only a foot tall are gonna be possibly seven to eight feet tall and they're gonna do a lot of shading. So what's on the other side from your light source, from your sun, on those? Are they plants that do okay without as much sun or do you need to make sure that you know, they're in a different spot so that everything can get sun. Just kind of thinking about those sort of things. Also think about from year to year to year, plant rotation. So if you have your tomatoes on one end, the next year you should move it to another spot and then another spot. Um, it's best if you do like your nightshades, which are your eggplants, um, eggplants, tomatoes, and peppers. Um, and then maybe put a legume like a pea and a bean there the next year so that you're using uh, plants that, that take different nutritional needs. Um, and that will help you grow better plants and um, they'll help each other with, with what the nutritional needs are. Um, what kind of garden do you want? Do you want it to be a raised bed? The older I get, the more I like raised beds. So you don't have to bow down quite as low but maybe you don't have the space, but maybe you're just starting out. It's fine to just till um, an area and, and go for that. We always say, if you're just starting out, start small. <laughs> you have big plans, but it can be a lot of work. So start maybe with a four by eight section, start that out. If it goes great and you're really loving it, you can expand year after year. I know I've certainly done that. You, know, you start with one little piece of landscape, you, know, you could put another bed over here and another bed over there but start small so that you don't get overwhelmed and you can have success. You're going the wrong way. Uh, most vegetables prefer um, pretty neutral um, on the soil. Seven is neutral, so 6.5, pretty soil, um, pretty neutral. Um, should get your soil tested, particularly if it's the first year. Um, URI does provide uh, pH testing and texture uh, testing. Um, or if you want a full test, which if it's your first year or about every three years, we do recommend getting a full soil test. You can send it out to UConn or UMass. It's not too much. I did mine last year. I think it was 15. Um, I sent out uh, two samples. And then they send you back all kinds of things that you can do, how to do it, how much, um, and different options for adding to uh, your soil to make it better. Um, and then you can go ahead and, and prepare it as such. Um, when you go to their sites, <clears throat> they will tell you what to do. Usually you dig from several different spots down about six inches, have it dry, um, and they'll tell you how much they want. The one I used, they wanted a cup of soil. So, you know, take a look at all their, their um, requirements, make sure that you do that, um, and then send it off. And now is a really good time to do that. If you get too much later in the season, they get really busy. So, you know, if you can get into your garden, <laughs> if it's not all frozen, <clears throat> this is a good time to grab that soil um, and get it sent off. Keep going backwards, sorry about that. Um, water considerations. Okay, so how close are you to the water? How close is the spigot? Are you gonna use hoses or watering cans? Um, do you want to, I'm gonna show you some soda bottle watering systems, um, which will help get uh, water right to the roots of your plant. It's kind of a fun thing, I've done it a few years. Um, you could use a soaker hose. Now a soaker hose is the one that kind of looks foamy. You put it out and it, the whole thing weeps. And what I did in mine is because I had a few places where it sort of jumped over beds is I used electrical tape where I didn't want it 
to be um, dripping so that I wasn't wasting all of that water dripping on my paths or that sort of thing. Um, and then if you want to go full out, um, you can do drip irrigation. It's clearly the most expensive way to go. It's also the most um, water friendly and that you can set it up so that it will water right where your plants are and not everything in between. And there is every bell and whistle you could possibly want um, in the drip irrigation. It's fun sometimes to just go onto the sites and just be like, oh my gosh, look at all these things. Um, so think about that. How much time do you want to spend in your garden watering? Um, are you going to, for years, I relied on the rain, not always the best choice if you want fantastic vegetables, but, <laughs> but you know, sometimes that's all the time you have and, and usually they will survive unless you have a really hot time and then make sure you have a watering can that you can run out there. So what is your time that you have to water? How much uh, time do you want to be doing that? How much money do you have to spend? Um, and how far do you have to lug your water? I'm just going to say this really quickly that we do not recommend uh, rain barrels for vegetables. They just grow too many pathogens um, and you should really, you know, do them on the flowers. That's fine. Um, so if you are doing a, a, you are keeping it in a water barrel, not, not on your, uh, your vegetables, please. So make your plan, especially if you're just starting out, choose vegetables you like, <laughs> you know, what does your family like to eat? Um, you don't want to grow all these weird things and then have nobody even want to eat them. Um, so grow the things that you like. Sometimes I've picked out beans when my kids were younger because like one was called a dragon bean and my kids were really into dragons and stuff and they liked beans. So that, that made sense and it made it fun for them. Um, so take a look at what things you like to eat. Your direct sow things are things that you're going to put directly into the garden. They're ones you're not going to start first. You can plant them right into the soil and they'll come up and do great. Things like your peas, your radishes, your carrots, your lettuce. Um, some things you need to either start seedlings early um, or you can buy them at a, a local uh, farm stand or maybe you have a nice friend who's growing extras in their basement that you can have. Um, and that's going to be like your pe peppers, your tomatoes, and your eggplants are the main things that you really need to buy the seedlings for. Pretty much everything else you can direct sow. Read your seed packets. You'll hear me say this over and over again. It has a ton of information on it. It will tell you exactly what to do. It will say start indoors or direct sow into your garden. Start in the, you know, right after frost or, you know, when the soil is warm. But it will tell you all of those things right on the seed packet. Seed catalogs are great things to get information. You can see all the new varieties that are out there. Um, and then you want to have a planting calendar. And I'm going to go over that a little bit too, um, for what you're going to plant indoors, what you're going to plant outdoors and when. So this is the one from the University of Rhode Island. Um, and it has, I don't know if you can see it, but it has all these, it's two-sided. It has all kinds of vegetables down the side. It gives you the how, <clears throat> excuse me, how many days to harvest. Um, and that is an estimate. It's really based on how many days above 70 degrees. Um, it's degree days. Um, but you can tell that, you know, if one is 45 and one is 90, well, clearly the 45 day one is going to be an earlier harvest than the 90 day one. So it's a good, it can be a good um, calibration there for you for what's going to be first, what's going to be second, what's going to be later. And then it'll run, it runs down through all of the months. And it will tell you I is something you're going to start indoors or S is something that you're going to direct sow. And you'll see that it's not like, oh, if I don't plant my peas by March, I, I, I can't plant peas. It's like, no, you can plant them in March and April and May and, and June and you'll still get a harvest. Um, so it's really kind of a nice resource. You can get that online. I think the next slide is just the other side of it. Um, it'll also tell you when to transplant things outside. Most important thing for transplanting things outside is to know your last frost date, which in Rhode Island is about May 15th. Um, so these are some of the things you can direct sow in the garden. Uh, I think you probably can see this slide a little bit better. Um, so March, you've got your, your carrots, your peas, your spinach, so all your cold, your cold crops. And a lot of these you can succession plant. You can start them now and then you can plant them later. Your lettuces, you can just plant and eat and plant and eat all summer long. It likes cool weather best, but it will still do all right for you in the summer. Um, so April, you can see there's a, another grouping there. I won't go through all of them. Um, May, start your beans. And starting in June, you can start your nice summer crops with your cucumbers and your squashes. 
So starting seed indoors, there is on the, <laughs> um, in the catalog that this one will be in online, there also is the seed starting um, indoors one. So you can go ahead and look at that, but it will help you with more with starting seeds just uh, on the indoor side. So if, if you're picking out things that need to be started, that will tell you all you need. Once you've started your seeds, so we've got the ones down here that are in the little tiny pot that's in my Keurig cups. I love my Keurig cups. We'll see those more in the demo section. Um, but when they get to the, be this big, especially with two of them in there, it's time to transplant them up. So this one got transplanted into some six packs here, well, where eventually you'll probably end up in a four inch pot. And it really depends on when you start your plants and what your end result is and when you're gonna be putting them out as to when you're gonna be starting them up. Um, so you may end up just being in a six pack. If they get really big, you might need to put them into the four inch pot. Um, but you wanna give them enough roots to grow. And I'm gonna show you some that are a little pot bound today, which means that they definitely are, are ready to be um, potted up, give them more room. Um, you'll stunt them. If I left them in this curry cup, um, they aren't gonna grow very fast. As soon as you start potting them up, they're gonna take off for you. Um, plants are very resilient. Um, as long as you don't dry them out all the way, um, they really can uh, jump back for you. So after the first or second true sets of leaves, that's when you're going to pick the pot that you're going to um, transplant it up into. The first set of leaves are called cotyledons. They all look pretty similar. They're just these nice smooth little leaves. And then once the true sets of leaves are the ones that look like the actual plant. Knowing when to plant these things outside, your timing is really critical. Again, know your last and uh, last frost dates and your first frost dates. First frost dates more for if you're trying to get that last grouping of beans in. You're kind of, oh, am I gonna, you know, am I gonna have enough time to grow them before we before we get to that first frost? Um, dates are average. You need to watch the weather. Um, you need to see what's going on. Um, you need to wait till the nighttime temperatures are are getting higher, like if they're above 50. Um, and you also want to keep an eye on what your soil temperature is. So it might be a nice warm day, but if it's been in the 30s, your soil is still going to be very cold. You don't want to be putting these plants into freezing um, cold soil because they're just not going to do anything and they're going to stress out and, and they're not going to like it very much. Um, so take a look. I've got the hardiness zones here for Rhode Island. Um, like I said, last Frost date is usually around May 15th. If you're in a different area of the country, you can either go to your extension service and ask them or look it up online as to what your zone is for your area. And you can get those last frost dates, which again are average. You can start planning it around then, but then you really need to look at the weather from day to day to make sure um, you've had enough warm weather to get ready to start putting things out. Um, you can use season extenders. That would be like a little greenhouse um, or a hoop house maybe that you could have outside. Um, and there's different ways to, to do those. You can have even just a, um, the little cloches. Sometimes those can work. If you plant things too quickly and you hear that it's gonna be frosted, you know, don't panic, you know, put in some stakes so that you're, when you put your sheets or whatever over your um, plants that they're not getting crushed, that'll give you a couple of degrees, but do keep your eye on that. And, and you know, best, you're really not gaining a lot by getting them out there super early because um, they're just going to sit there. Hardening off is really, really important. So you've grown these beautiful little seedlings down in your basement and you've been doing it for the last eight weeks. They're finally, you know, really nice looking plant. Um, but they've been in your basement where they haven't been able to experience strong winds, where they haven't been able to experience the sun, where they haven't experienced a lot of fluctuation in temperature. So that's what the hardening off process does. It really acclimates them to being into the real world. Okay. Think of it a lot as uh, that first day at the beach, you know, everybody's like, yeah, it's warm. We're all going to go to the beach and we all lay out in the sun and then we all get sunburned. Okay, the same thing's going to happen to your plant. So you want to start it slow. So begin um, by bringing them in and out, put them in a place that's uh, shaded and protected, bring them in, um, put them back outside. Again, watch your night temperatures. Um, you don't really want it to go below 45 too much because it, it just it just stresses them out. And then they're just not going to do as well. So you want to, you're going to still baby them, but a little less than you did when they were in your basement or when they were at the nursery. Um, so reduce the frequency of watering also. 
Um, it'll slow them down. Don't allow them to wilt. But again, you want them to get used to the fact that, hey, you know, I might not be looking at you three times a day because I walk by on the way to the laundry room. Um, you want to know, you want them to get used to the fact that they're going to go into the real world and that they, they, can, they can do it on their own. Um, so after hardening off, um, they'll be able to tolerate light a lot better and they'll be able to um, tolerate, you know, that little bit of frost if some comes along. Again, you know, make sure you're paying attention to your, to your weather. So ready, getting ready to plant, yes. So your seed packets, again, they have all the information that you need to know about wind and spacing and depth and thinning. And thinning is wind, particularly with small seeds when you, you put down quite a bit. Um, they all come up and it's great, but you need to make sure that you have enough space. Like if you have a million carrot seeds coming up, you want them to have a nice, you know, maybe inch around them so that it could be a carrot. If they're planted closer than that, then they just aren't going to be able to grow and you're not going to get any good carrots. So you want to space them out, I believe it's two or three inches actually per carrot. But again, it will say it on the back of your seed packet. And things will change from variety to variety as well. So, you know, really read what it says and, and pay attention to that. It can be really hard to space things properly, but it's, it's so important in the long run if you, you will end up with uh, healthier plants and better vegetables, um, better flowers too. I mean, if they're too pushed together, then they don't grow well either. Um, you're going to be purchasing... Uh, seedlings, either grow your own or get them from a knowledgeable local grower um, and watch the planning calendars again and watch the weather. feel like a, a broken, broken record here, but uh, it really is important. The day of seeding. Best to plant on a shady or overcast day. Um, again, you're going to be stressing out your plants. So if you do it in the afternoon, you can get them all settled in. Then you can kind of settle down for night. Um, although we don't generally recommend watering at night, this time it's okay because you don't want them to be in the total bright light and in the strong heat um, where all that water that you just gave them um, is, is evaporating away and they're respiratory and they're, uh, you know, drying up and want to give them a nice, nice quiet night. Um, your soil should be damp before you start. And I'll show you a little bit about um, how to tell if it's the right wetness or not. So it shouldn't be dry, it shouldn't be soaked either. We don't wanna be planting things in swamps. Um, again, we need to make sure that our soil is draining well. Follow our planting calendar for when to plant your seeds, read the back of the packet. And again, the planting calendar will tell you that, you know, it doesn't have to just be this month. You know, there's a, there's a broad range of when you can be planting things have your row markers ready, have your watering cans out um, so that when you get out to the garden, you aren't running back and forth and going, oh, I forgot this or I forgot that. Um, so kind of plan ahead. And it, and it can be fun. You know, just take, take the day before you're going to plant and, uh, and get everything ready. So sometimes you're going to make rows, which are pretty self-explanatory, um, or a hill. A hill is basically exactly what it says, but instead of being a rounded hill, it's a flat hill. So really it's a, a tall or short plateau. Uh, um, most of the times that'll be for like your squash or your cucumbers um, and a row is a row. Make sure that you mark both ends of your rows. Um, again, you, you, know, you put it in and you're sure that you're gonna remember it. You cover up the seeds, you turn around and then you're like, okay, where did I end that row? Cause now it all looks the same cause it all looks like dirt. Um, so make sure you're marking both ends. That way, you know, particularly I, what I like to do with like my beans is I'll, I'll do like a two or three foot section. I'll wait a couple weeks and then I'll do a two or three foot section after that. Hopefully they're coming up by then and I can see them, but if not, that way I've got it marked and I'm not planting on top of them again. Um, place the seeds to proper depth and spacing. Guess where you find that information? Yes. Back of your seed packet. Okay, so take a look at that. Rule of thumb is about one to two times of the size of the seed. So some of your larger seeds are going to go a little deeper. Some of your smaller seeds, your lettuces and that sort of thing are going to go right on top of the soil. Also look um, as to whether or not they should be covered. A lot of your lettuces and arugulas and the such um, do like to have some light to germinate. Water gently, okay? You want to settle your seeds down into the soil 
and you took all this time to place them just perfectly, and you can take that hose and you just whale it right over top of it, and you're making all kinds of divots and, and canyons, and you know, it's sort of like the Colorado River making the Grand Canyon. And you, you don't really want to do that because that all that work you just did will be gone. So water gently, make sure you have a watering can that has the little holes on the end, the spigots, um, or that you have a if you're using the hose attachment that has one that has the shower setting. So you can just, you know, make it like rainfall and water them gently. Pretty much any time you plant a seed, you transplant a plant, um, you want to water them in. Um, and what that does is it settles the soil down around the plant or around the seed and gives it good contact with the soil. Don't plant too early. Okay, start with your plants being hardened off, just like we talked about, and do the cool weather um, as best, again, evening plantings. Um, you know, it's more fun for you, too, than being out there when it's super hot, to, you know, getting all hot and whatever in the, in the garden. So, you know, when it's nice and cool, cloudy is best. Um, sometimes you want to add some fertilizer into your hole. Part of that's going to depend on what you've done to amend your garden already, but a little starter fertilizer in the bottom of the hole um, will give them a little bit of extra oak high in phosphorus will help the root system read the bottle or the can or the box or the bag of your fertilizer and it will tell you what you should be using for um, initial plantings and then how you should use it uh, once it's an established garden. More is not enough. Particularly at this point in time, you don't want to put too much in the bottom of the hole and you're going to be taking those stressed out roots and burning them. So read the label on any fertilizer that you use. Keep in mind how big these plants are going to get. And this can be really hard. Um, so if it says two feet between plants, that's from the center of the plant to the center of the next plant, um, you should do that. And I'm really bad at that. But you know, sometimes that one more tomato plant um, is really, really not worth it because you'll end up with a tomato jungle, which is hard to harvest, doesn't grow as well, and um, doesn't get the airflow that it needs. So it encourages um, disease and mildews um, in your garden. So do try to remember that. They look so far apart when they're little though. Um, start with damp soil again, same thing as with seed starting. Um, both in the garden and in your pot. You don't want the roots to be dry when you're taking them out of the pot. You want them to be moist. They're a lot more flexible when they're moist. When they're dry, they're much more brittle and you're more likely to break more of them. Some are gonna break, it's okay, they'll be fine. So dig your hole a little wider than the plant pot. Remove them carefully and we'll go over some of that in the demo. Try not to pull on their stems. Oh, I can't get them out of here. You know, to tump it over, tap the bottom, squish around the pot, um, and try to let it fall out that way. Um, remember that the little stems there are kind of like their necks. That's where all the nutrients and water flow from the root part of the plant into the leaves and the vegetables. So you really want to make sure that you're taking care not to squash those. Um, take a look at the root ball when you take it out of the pot. Um, loosen them up if they need to be. Um, sometimes you'll see them, and I'm hoping that I have one for you today um, that goes around and around. Um, you want to make those go around. The roots will continue to go around and around if you don't loosen them up. So just, I call them tickling. You kind of tickle the roots down and loosen it up a little bit. For most of everything, you're going to want to place it in the hole at the same level as it was in the pot. Um, so all your herbs, your annuals, um, your perennials, all those sorts of things. Take a look at where it is in the pot and you want to plant it at that same level. OK, you don't want to bury it. That's going to kill it. And you don't want to have it up too high because now you've got these roots that are like wondering where the soil is. OK, so it's really important that you keep them at the same level. Um, so when you initially do it, put them in. You think you've got it good. Water it in really good. Sometimes that will sort of change the level of the soil, you know, it'll fall down in, maybe it wasn't compact enough, uh, maybe it rinses to one side. At this point, you can change it fairly easily. So if you need to pull it up a little and or pull it up and put more soil down, whatever you need to do to make it so that it's at the right level, this is the time to do that. Um, the other thing too, when you water in your seeds, I didn't mention this, sometimes you think you've got a perfect, all of a sudden they look like they're popping up. 
Um, Cause the soil's washing off a little bit or just moving around with the thing, just, you know, go ahead and push them back in, but do look at your rows after you, after you plant those seeds um, and after you've watered and make sure that they are where they're supposed to be. Um, so back to the transplants again, press it, press it down. Um, sometimes you can put a little depression around the outside, just holds the water from, from running from side to side and it will, will um, water down. You want them to go down into those roots. It's called watering in. So always want to water them in. For tomatoes, so really for any of your nightshades, these are a little bit different. So it's your tomatoes, your eggplants, and your peppers. You can dig a deeper hole. So if you have um, a long leggy tomato, it's usually the tomatoes, not so much the peppers and the eggplants because they just don't do it as much. Um, don't worry about it being really tall and, you know, what is all this stem? Because all that stem can turn into roots. Um, so you're going to dig a hole deep or horizontally. Um, you're going to cover the stems so that there's really only just a small amount on the top. Um, remove any leaves that are going to be buried. I mean, we love to compost our leaves, but we don't want to have rotting leaves that are still attached to our live plant. Okay, so remove any of those leaves, just pinch them off that are going to be below the soil level. Um, and then you can go ahead and plant them. You can see in the picture here that we've got it laying to the side and then we'll go ahead and bury that. And, and the bottom picture here you can see, um, like this is probably um, just a stem that's laying on the ground um, and it, it, will, it will root down in. So that's what's gonna happen underneath the ground when you, when you plant these is you're gonna get all these roots that'll come out. And that's really what you want. When you're first starting out, you really wanna have a great root system for your plant so that they can be growing those vegetables for you later. So in the little picture on the bottom, we have the one planted straight, and then we have one that's bent up. The trick to the bending up one, and I'll, I'll show you it on a miniature scale when we do the demo, is to lay your pot on its side the morning or the night before you're gonna plant it. Um, and it will actually decide where it wants to bend and because it will try to go up. It likes to grow straight. It doesn't want, it's not gonna keep growing onto the side. It's gonna grow up. So then you can just take your plant, which is already curled for you, and bury it um, in its natural way. You don't have to worry about um, bending it and breaking it um, if you do that. So plant your plan. This is my garden. And we can see here is uh, July sometime. And these are my tomatoes in the back. And oh, look at that. I got some pretty nice spacing there. And yeah, no, I don't. I had to put that one more tomato in. Come to August, I'm not even fruiting yet. And I already have this jungle going on. This was a couple of years ago. So yeah, maybe we just never learned. But <laughs> last year I did pretty well with it. Um, so anyway, you just really want to make sure that even though it looks like you've got this huge garden space and you have nothing in it, trust that your plants will grow. And then go in every day, enjoy your garden. You know, you don't have to fuss with it all the time, but just enjoy it. Let it be a haven for you. Let it be a haven for animals. Um, our connection to nature is, is just a wonderful thing. And, and it's just great to see, you know, how they grow. It's just, it's really pretty amazing. Um, all right, we are going to do some demos. All right, so we're going to start with a little guy here. So this is uh, one of my little curd cups. He really should have been transplanted up a few days ago, at least. <laughs> He's pretty long, but this is what they'll do. Um, they'll get really long like this and leggy. Um, and, and that's okay, because we're going to plant them up. So to go with my theme from the last class is that Take a look around your house and there's lots of things that you can use um, as pots. So we're gonna plant in, in a cutoff soda bottle. I have holes in the bottom, but you could put them into you know, a four pack. You, know, you can have a pot. If you're using a pot that you've used before, you wanna make sure you clean it really well. And we recommend that you sanitize it with a 10% bleach solution, read the bottom. The back of your uh, bleach bottle, it will tell you how to sanitize um, and soak it in there for a little bit. It just helps kill all the pathogens that may have been in your soil or in your plant from the year before. Um, and then you'll have a nice clean pot to start your plant off in. The other thing, which you know, just actually was, these were some molasses cookies from the other day. Now look, I'm like, 
wow, that would make like a fabulous pot. And on top of that, it's top works really great as a saucer for under your plant. So while you've got it inside, you're not going to make a mess. So it's pretty big. You know, if you, you could, you could maybe not do the soil all the way to the top, or you could cut it off if you wanted. Again, make sure you put holes in the bottom of anything that you're using. So there's drainage. All right, so let's get back to this little guy. So I'm going to hold him finger in between. I'm going to give a little squish. I'm going to turn him over. Come on. Get him to come out. Come on. Give him a little time. Make a little mess. Okay. So he was pretty big. I don't know if you can see that or not, but these roots here are going around and around. So we're going to tickle them down a little bit, and then we're going to divide it apart. So I'm just going to wiggle it back and forth. Oh, nice long roots there. I'm gonna put him right down in that little hole. Push him right down in because he's a tomato plant, right? My secret stash of soil under here. Keep going down. I should plant him quite a bit deeper than this. really bring him down. I don't know if you can see it that well. See if I can get a shot of it here. We'll bring it down to the right, right up to the leaves. Um, so I could plant him a little deeper if we wanted to. We're going to put him back in here. Yeah. And then what are we going to do? What we always do after we plant, right, we're going to water it in. Let's drink. If you use the soda bottle, it's one of the things that I like about the soda bottle is that it doesn't take up a lot of space this direction. So if you look at it with the four pack, it's almost the same size. So if you get four of these in the same places, you can get the, the four pack, but it gives your plant a lot more root to grow down. Um, when you go to go in the garden, just give it a slice down the side, make it a lot easier for you to take the plant out. going to go outside. Ooh, we have a garden. So we're going to talk about, um, we had mentioned the water bottles, so how you can, you can uh, water your garden. And you would want to do this at the same time as you're planting your plants because you're going to dig holes. Um, so you want to have your, know where your plants are going to go. And then you're going to use your bottles. Um, to plant next to them. So this one has holes here and holes on the side and the top is open. We're gonna plant it in here. My soil is not deep, but we'll, you can plant it, you know, you have a good inch coming out. This one, we're gonna go the other direction. I've got holes all around the bottom here. Put them in there like that. So you'd have your plant here, maybe another plant here. The other thing is these are a little small unless you're doing it into a planter. I would use, you know, like a two liter bottle so that you can have lots of water. And what this does is instead of watering the top of the soil, it's going to put the water right down um, into the root zone. Put some water in that. And then that's what it's gonna be doing. I think you can see that. So it's gonna spew out like that. And then the cool thing, I've done this one. I don't really like the open top as much as the closed one, um, just cause things get in it um, and it can get clogged up a little bit. This one, this one's kind of cool. And this one you can regulate. So if I've got the top on, it's a slow drip. If I open it up, it's a faster drip. Now it's coming out from the side holes as well. So slow or fast. So you can kind of regulate it. If you want it to last a little longer or just drip out the bottom, you just do that. That will give you 
some water right to the root. So again, just sort of a fun thing that you can do, um, works well in planters as well, makes it easy to really get, the, the, get it watered way down in. Um, but you know, that's, that's up to what, what you like to do. Um, wait, it's an option. <clears throat> Take those out of there. All right, my hole's buried. So now we've got our nice flat surface here. I'm gonna get ready to plant some seeds. So we're gonna plant our seeds. We wanna have our tags ready and our seeds ready. Okay, so again, so these are our, our pea seeds. So if we read, read the back of our seed packets, so sow an average soil in full sun in early spring for a first crop or in late summer for a fall crop. So it gives you the two options. So we're gonna pretend it's early spring. So let's put start our row here. I'm gonna make our little trench. And this says about two inches apart and it's gonna be about one inch deep. We can make ourselves a little one inch trench there because we don't, we don't wanna, we don't wanna build a mound. We want a, tr a trench when we're done. We want it to still be flat so that our water will stay where it belongs. Pull out our seeds. We're just gonna pop them in. Like that. We're just gonna take that soil that we brought up and we're just gonna cover it into the hole. Pack it down. And water it in. I'll be searching for these later tonight. Okay. So our next thing we're going to plant is we're gonna do some summer squash. So we'll come over here next to that. So the, for the summer squash, we're gonna do it in a hill. So again, like I said, it's not really a hill, it's more of a flat plateau. I like to do these, you don't have to do this. Um, it kind of loosens up the soil where you're gonna put the seeds. So it makes it a little bit easier um, for them to germinate and get those first roots down in. Mark it right in the middle like that. And these are pretty big seeds. So we're just gonna lay them on top. I like to do four or five per hill. Um, if they all come up, you probably wanna transplant a couple and take them out really easily and put them somewhere else in your garden. Last year I had so many come up, I ended up having some pots that are usually ornamentals in my front and I, what the heck, they were, they were squash last year. And just cover those up, that, put my seeds back in. Water those in as well. And you water, water it really well. We're not gonna do the amount of time that it really should take tonight, just cause let's move on to other things. So we're gonna transform our garden into the spot where we're gonna be putting other plants. Bring this up, look at my notes here. So this is seed tape. So this is for carrots um, and they're spaced about every inch and a half to two inches on the seed tape. And the way you do a seed tape, again, read the bottom of the, uh, of the back of the package. We just sort of lay it down onto the, onto the soil. You'll cover that up and then water it in. So it's kind of a fun thing. You can make your own seed tapes as well with just some, um, flour and water paste and, um, and paper towels. And this one, this one goes on top of a pot and it has zinnias. So this is a zinnia mix one. So same thing, you would put it on top of your moistened soil, cover that up, water it in, and hopefully you'll have a whole pot of zinnias come up. Um, one thing I didn't mention that I had wanted to was how do you tell when your soil is the right amount? If it's really dry, it's going to be really dusty. If it's really wet, when you squeeze it, it's going to drip out all over the place. When it's proper, it will make it'll make a little lump in your hand. See how it kind of sticks together, but it also breaks up really easily. So that means it's at the right moisture level. All right, so let's plant the plant here. This is a rosemary plant. And so we're about here. 
So we're going to take a look at what size hole we need. You can do this with a trowel, but this is nice, soft, soft, fluffy, fluffy soil. Yeah, bigger is better than less. Okay, then I'm going to hold it with my fingers here around either side of the stem and hold on to the sides of the pot. We're going to flip it over. We're going to give a little, little push. Let that come out. Then we want to check the roots. So this isn't too bad, but there's quite a few right there on the edges. So what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of lift those up a little bit. Again, we want to tickle them open a little. We don't want them growing in. We want them to grow out when we, for when we plant them. I'm going to set it in the hole. I think my hole's a little deep. That looks about right. We're just going to put it in. Tamp it down nicely. And then we would water that in as well. Um, when I was saying the little trench, you can make a little trench like that. What that'll do, it won't stay for long, but for the first couple waterings, it will just keep the, a little bit of a reservoir of water here, a little moat around your, um, around your plant. And then that will hold the water to drip down into those roots versus dispersing um, throughout your garden. We had talked about in the other class about maybe making a paper pot. Um, so this little seedling is, is in a paper pot. Um, whenever you plant a pot that you're going to plant, you want to make sure that you peel back the top. So if this is um, a paper pot that you've made, it's a peat pot, anything like that, you want to go ahead and dig down and then you want to rip back the edges. You don't want those edges staying up above the soil line because what that does is they'll dry out and it'll go down and it'll just start drying out um, your plant. So you want those to stay moist. So we're just gonna cover all of that up. It still sticks up. We can just do a little more. This is a tomato plant, so we don't need to worry about the tops. We can just plant it right in there. All right, so we got our little paper pot planted. Um, all right, we're getting there. So this morning, Wish I had a bigger one for you. <laughs> but this morning, this guy was standing straight like this. I don't know if you can see that very well, but he's now bending around the pot. So if you had one in a pot like this and it's, you know, it's that tall, lay it on its side by the afternoon or certainly by the next day, it's going to have found where it wants to curl up. So this, I'll put this guy back under the lights right side up. And uh, you can see him and he'll straighten back up in the morning, um, but it doesn't take long, but that's, you know, he, he really bent. Um, <laughs> I would have thought it would be more like this, but maybe my pot was a little, little kilter. And so he, he really bent over the side there. Um, so it does work. And Last fun thing would be just if anybody has, if anybody is repeat from last week or from two weeks ago, these are the microgreens that we planted in the class. So they're looking pretty good. I'll probably bring those upstairs with me and, and start eating them. Anyway, that's the end of our demo. So I guess we can go into, into questions if we're ready. Yeah, are you ready? Okay. Yes. So um, someone asks, can you just start seeds in larger pots? I'm assuming you, so you don't have to keep um, transplanting. Keep them. transplanting. You can. I'll let you know that it is fun to transplant. And then um, what happens sometimes too is, is like I planted these in little pots. This, nothing came up. I planted two seeds in here and I got nothing. <laughs> if I planted two seeds in here and got nothing, that's a lot of wasted soil and, and, and a lot of wasted space. Um, if you're growing under lights, at least for me, I have one flat, about one and a half flats worth. So maybe it, what's that like two feet, two and a half feet worth of space. If I plant them into the small containers, then I can pick the best ones. And those are the ones that I'll pot up from there. Um, like I was saying with the soda bottle, Again, if you put it in the soda bottle, instead of something like this, you have a lot of soil, but you're not taking up so much real estate. Um, so that's one thing to think about. The other thing is that you really wanna have not a compact root ball, 
but a fairly firm root ball when you go to transplant. You don't want a lot of just really loosey-goosey um, roots because then they're more likely to break. So if they're in a little bit smaller container, when you, when you go ahead and transplant them up, they'll fill it up. And then when you put it into the garden, you'll have a little bit better um, compaction of your roots to put down in. And then from there, they'll grow out. Um, you know, it certainly, you could grow all of them in here. So, you know, I like to transplant. I love these curd cups because I just think they're so cute. Um, and they have, you know, they come already with a hole in the bottom. Um, so yes, you could, yeah. but that's why I don't because it's a lot of work, a lot of soil wasted. If you don't have anything come up, you can reuse the soil to some extent. Um, especially if nothing came up. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> All right. So what about um, the option instead of starting indoor seedlings, if you start seeds directly into the soil before the last frost date and cover them with plastic or hoops or blankets or something to keep them warm enough? Is that an option? Well, depending on the, depending on the plant, um, your peas right now, your your tomatoes, your your eggplant, and your green peppers. That's not an option. They're not going to grow. Um, they won't grow until this till the soil is warm, um, and that takes a lot longer than the than the air being warm. So you're going to have more chance of if you did that with tomatoes and peppers and those sorts of things that don't like it cold, they're just going to rot and die. Or if they freeze, they're going to burst. Um, mm -hmm. But your things like your peas. Really, peas, as soon as you can work the soil, you can plant them. They can take the frost. They can take um, a little bit of cold feet. Um, so really get to know your plants. Um, but yeah, you're, if I put this outside now, I've wasted four weeks. <laughs> you know. So yeah, so really the ones that they say start indoors. You could start some outdoors. I think all of us, if we have compost piles, have had the volunteers that come up. The problem is, is that in the Rhode Island area, to get them to fruit, um, sometimes you can by starting the seeds when it's all when it's warm enough and you're starting them in June. But the likelihood of getting to a full harvest on an eggplant, a pepper, or a tomato that you started in the garden as a seed is less likely. So mm -hmm. it gives you fruits earlier, um, and you're taking a big chance that you aren't even going to make it. And for those gardeners outside of Rhode Island, um, they should check their local master gardener extension group and That's find out their own zone to see what works best. Yes. Yes. Okay. You should definitely know what the last frost dates are um, and your first frost dates for, you know, if you're trying to extend your season um, are in your area. So yeah, go to your extension service or, or online. Um, a lot of places you can think of, you know, just look up what's my zone you know, put in your address and it will pop up what it is um, and you can research from there. Okay. Can you go over the laying down, bending and curling of tomato plants the night before planting? Okay. So you can, you can plant your tomatoes deep and they'll grow their roots out of the stems. So like this guy, again, I can't, you can see how he's kind of tall and his leaves start here. So all of this will turn into root if I bury it. This is again with nightshade plants only, not with like your rosemaries, you'll kill it. So um, with your tomatoes. So if this were a two foot tall plant, you know, coming up here, you, know, you probably aren't, you could probably bury a good foot of it, leave the last foot. That's a big hole. <laughs> so if you take the plant and you just lay it on its side, you know, lay it on its side like that, it will curl all on its own. It will do, this one was straight. This morning it was straight, and now it's like it's it's actually facing down. So I must have had I must have had it at an angle. Um, so it was straight, and now it's not. Mm -hmm. um, so they will naturally do that. They'll naturally want to go up and go up to the light by doing that ahead of time and letting it do it naturally. You're not bent. You know these are pretty small, so I can bend them. But when they, you know, when if you've got a two foot tall tomato, it can be hard to to bend to get that root um, in there. And again, you know, get it in as far as you can. If you, you know, <laughs> it's really fine if there's more coming up. It'll be a little leggier. It, you know, it will still grow to eight feet tall for you. Um, but this is just a way to get a little bit better, a little bit larger root system. Mm -hmm. 
Um, okay, so any strategy for dealing with invasive worms disrupting uh, midsummer direct sowing? Well, I'm not an expert on invasive worms. <laughs> um, I would go to your extension. And I would call the hotline number on that. Um, the better that you can identify the plants that you're planting, as well as the worms themselves, the better um, they'll be able to give you a remedy um, to help with that. That is is not not my thing. Okay. Um, a practical question. How do you make the holes in your watering bottles? Okay. <laughs> that is a very <laughs> practical. There's a couple different ways. Um, I drilled the ones in my water bottles, um, but you can also take like a nail and put it in, in the bottom actually of my, I don't know what to do with it. The one I planted in, which I seem to have lost now. <laughs> the one I planted in, I actually cut with scissors, um, just made little slits in the bottom. So if you're going to be doing it for the watering, I would probably do a drill or mm -hmm. a nail so that you're kind of controlling where you're putting that a little bit more. You can put them going out to the sides um, if you want to, you know, or you can do it all the way around. It depends on where you're going to put your plants and where you're going to put your bottle um, based on the, the rest of your, your garden plan. Okay. So how about when you're thinning, do you just cut them? Or do you pull out the individual plants that you're thinning to perhaps move somewhere else or share with neighbors? <laughs> well, you can do both. So okay. basically what we just did with the, uh, the one that I potted up, that was thinning as, as, you know, as we divided the two and put it into one. Um, if you're doing it in the garden, uh, you can pull them out. Like if you're doing carrots, just pull them out. <laughs> um, when I'm doing it, yeah, so that's, so I've got two here. One is really a runt um, and the other one's pretty good. So I would cut this one out and if you're going to cut it out in the pot like this, go down below the soil level and cut it out. Um, you don't want it to continue to try to grow because the whole reason for thinning it is so that you're not um, competing with the other plant. So, you know, with two like this and, you know, I don't need this many tomatoes. I can only, I should only fit six. Um you know, you could just go ahead and cut that out. If you're thinning in the garden, you can pull them out. You can try transplanting them. A lot of people will plant their lettuce and then, uh, you know, kind of dig it up a little bit and, and put it somewhere else. It, it can be really fun. Um, remember things like lettuce, uh, you can eat it as babies. So, you know, you cut those off, eat those as spring greens, let the other ones grow up a little bit bigger. And that way you can get a nice succession harvest out of it too. Nice. Um, what about starting corn indoors and then replanting? Um, Anthony says that he's seen where it's been started in toilet paper tubes and then replanted. Okay. Um, I was going to say it doesn't like to be transplanted, but he answered his question there. So um, let me give a second here. I have, a, I have a tube. So anytime, again, that you're planting in something like this, that you're going to be planting um, into directly into the ground and things like your sunflowers, corn. I, I don't usually think of corn as something that you, you start inside, but you could. Um, and it might be kind of fun, particularly if it's a home garden. Um, if you're going to grow a, a lot of it, this is a lot of work because um, they can be direct sown, but this will give it a little bit of a head start. Um, it's good because you don't disturb the roots. Um, with the paper towels, um, I like to open up the bottom. So it's more of a tube when you plant it. And then again, you want to rip that so that it's down below the soil level when you plant it. But that is a good way to, to plant some of those things that don't like to be disturbed, like your corn, your sunflowers, um, some of your squashes and stuff. I think squash grows just as well direct seeding. But, you know, if you're having fun starting stuff inside, why not? Um, so that, that could work. Okay. Um, cold stratification. What can you tell us? Okay. Read your seed packet. <laughs> it will tell you if it needs a cold period. A lot of times, um, particularly in annuals or perennials, they need to have a, a wintering over um, to, to get them to, to bloom well. Um, the other thing that you can do is uh, to help with germination. So that would be one thing that's what needs the cold period. And then you can do scarification too, which is like um, when you soak or nick the seed casing to a plant um, to help it germinate faster. <laughs> 
Sorry, I was doing double duty. <laughs> That's okay. Um, okay, how do you keep the critters from eating your work? It is an ongoing battle, um, <laughs> but fencing in general is your is your best um, best bet. Um, and try to identify which critters you have. Um, if you have a groundhog, good good luck. Um, with a groundhog, you really need to dig down and out with fencing as well as up. Bunnies, for the most part, as long as your fencing is small enough and high enough, which I had mine not high enough last year, and I had some bunnies get in. Um, deer, you need six feet at least um, so that they'll stay out of your garden. Um, so really find out what, what critters are you trying to prevent. It is really hard. Moles, voles, and mice are extremely difficult. Um, you know, I've heard various things about the little things that make the noise or, um, you know, sometimes you can put things that, that, that uh, like tin, tin pie plates and stuff that will make noise in the wind. After a while, they get used to things like that. Um, but, but you can try birds. If you're having problems with birds, we actually, in the, one of the demo gardens, we've strung um, fish line across the garden and they don't like the fish line. Um, you can tie uh, like streamers on it too. And that kind of scares things away. It's an ongoing battle um, with animals. Sometimes you just need to know that you're going to share some. <laughs> Everybody needs to eat, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, you're helping nature. Right. When repotting leeks, how do you recognize true leaves and when should you repot <laughs> or repot or um, the seedlings? That, that is a great question, because you're right. Um, it's hard to tell. So really, for your leeks, they, we do it more by height. You probably want them to be four to six inches tall. Um, I plant leeks, which I use these two. Uh, you kind of tickle them apart, plant them deep in a, in a trench. Initially, plant them more or less at the initial, uh, at the same spot that they were at. But with leeks, as you go along in the season, let them get established, then start filling them in and then keep mounting them up. You can use uh, paper towel tubes. This is what I do in my garden to put around the leak. Um, if you do it when it's small, you can just slip it over the top. You still want to make sure enough's coming out so that they're getting the sun and stuff. That will give you a longer white portion on the bottom of your leak. Um, I, I hope that answered the question. It, it, the true leaves, I mean, they come up, they aren't like with the cotyledons and the true leaves. So just make sure that they're big enough when you tickle them apart, plant them down in. And again, you can mound them as you, as you go along so that you can have a nice, a nice long stem. Okay. Do you recommend fertilizer at the time of transplanting or do you wait later to do that? I do think it's good to put a little bit in the hole. Um, again, read the bottom, um, the bottom or the back or whatever uh, you have your instructions on your fertilizer. Um, they'll usually say how much to put in uh, the hole if it's um, at planting, how much to use throughout the season. Um, so yeah, read that. I do like to, to um, work some into the soil. So you're gonna, usually it's a, you dig the hole, pour or sprinkle, depending on what type of fertilizer you're using, mix it into the soil some, cause you don't want that fertilizer to be right against your plants. You don't want it to be really concentrated. So mix that in a little bit, then go ahead and plant. Just make sure that you have that. Make sure, this is not coming out right, that you have nutrients down that deep um, when you're planting the plant. Okay. Um, do you use inoculants for seeds when they're suggested? I don't do anything to my seeds. Okay. Um, oh, can you plant seeds in the Keurig coffee grinds that are already in the Keurig container? That's probably going to be too acidic because um, coffee, you can put your coffee grinds and stuff around your hydrangeas mm -hmm. um, or yeah. any plants that, that like the acid. Um, but no, you, sh you shouldn't just plant them. You could try, but it's, I would guess it's going to be too acidic for them. Okay. How about um, the germinating on the paper towel method? Um, how do you time when to put that out into the garden before the roots start clinging to the paper? And is that a concern? Okay, are you doing it um, 
Okay, I'll, I'm going to address this two ways because I'm not sure which question. Um, if you're making a seed tape, so you're taking the paper towel and you're putting down the flour and paste mixture and you're putting your seeds down and then another layer on top, you're going to do that like the day or two before. Um, the ones that you buy are are dry. <laughs> you know, they, they use a different process than your homemade one. So you're only going to do that about a day before. Um, and then you would go ahead and plant them out. If you're, if you're pre-germinating your seeds to see if they're viable or because you only want to plant ones that you know are going to germinate, which would be when you spread your seeds out on a wet paper towel, cover them with another wet paper towel, put them inside an open plastic bag and put them in a warm place check them every couple of days, you'll start to see when they're sprouting. At that point, you can be very, very careful because they're very fragile. You could go ahead and plant them from there into a pot or, or wherever. Um, the only time I generally do that would be if I'm questioning um, how old my seed is, or if I just really want to make sure that it's germinating. Um, you can pre-soak some, like I'd mentioned earlier, that's with that same paper towel method, like your nasturtium seeds and your ones that are that really are thick, big seeds. Just softens them up a little bit before you put them into the ground. So I hope one of those answers answered the question. Okay. Um, when planting your garden, what vegetables grow best on a trellis besides peas and beans, which everybody seems to know about? <laughs> Actually, last year I used sort of a trellis system on my tomatoes. Um, and really most things you can trellis up. You can trellis up your squash. Um, the whole uh, thing you want to be careful with with trellising is you want to have it set up ahead of time so that when the plants are small, you can start training them onto that trellis. You don't want to take a big long squash plant or whatever and try to force it up onto a trellis because then you're gonna break it um, and it's not gonna be as happy. So you wanna start weaving it through your trellis or you know whatever, or tying it on, whatever it is, the method you're using to get it to trellis up. Um, so as soon as the plant starts coming up, start training it to go where you want it to go. Okay, um, I'm just gonna say there's quite a few questions about different um, insects and um, things that want to come, come and bore into your plants. I, we'd probably recommend to, I mean, a lot of that information is online. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. I'll go to your extension service because it's really important to know what plant and what um, insect um, you're, you're requiring about, because there's certainly a lot. The only thing I will mention is when you're planning out your garden, that if you plant your squash later, since they'd mentioned bore, um, you'll miss a lot of the season. So if you're planting your squash in June, um, you're more likely to get squash borers. So you'll want to watch for that. If you're planting your squash in July or a little bit later, um, a lot of times you kind of miss their season because um, they've already gone and gotten your neighbor's plants. Um, okay. So just keep in mind, but yeah, call, you know, go ahead and find out what you've got, what plants you've got it on and call your extension or your hotline and they can walk you through it. Great. All right. Last question, because it came up twice. Um, curious if the plastics that people use put PCPs in the soil, and then is it recyclable after the season is over? You mean like if we're putting the plastic bottles into the soil? Yeah. Mm. Um, I'll admit it's not, I, I don't know that answer. I don't, I'm not one who worries about that. I would just say if that is something that you're concerned about, that there are a lot of other methods that you can use and other things that you can use um, to not use that. Okay. You know, you can find other containers, you know, you can, you can use your cardboard, you don't need to use these different plastic containers. Um, so there are a lot of other options out there for you to use if you don't want to use plastics. Okay. Um, and I, I will just add, um, being a librarian, all of your local libraries have lots of good resources on gardening, companion gardening, ways to keep out insects and, uh, and pests. So, you know, check them out. Um, we just want to say uh, um, on behalf of Fatima, Lee and myself, thank you so much, Sue. This was so fantastic. Um, we love that you have a garden inside and that demo was fantastic. I loved it. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who um, joined us tonight. 
Uh, the final program in our series is on Thursday, March 24th, also by Zoom at 6.30. Uh, Katerina Lorenzo, Lorenzo, I'm sorry, will be speaking on food sovereignty in cities. Um, she'll talk about the importance of growing food, describe what products can be successfully planted and harvested in the city without the need for a large space, and she'll share some growing techniques. Um, I would like to note that the entirety of this presentation will be in Spanish, However, audio translation will be available for the recording. Um, so please join us if you'd like by registering at www.provcomlib.org forward slash seed links. And remember if you uh, missed one of our past programs or you'd like to watch this one again because it was so full of good information, um, you can go to YouTube and look up Providence Community Library and all of our recordings are there. Um, all right, I think that's it. Thank you so much, everybody. And make sure that you stay tuned to um, Providence Community Library's website because we are going to be offering more workshops in the future um, as the season you know, comes upon us. So happy gardening, everybody. And they have, and they have free seeds. Yes, free seeds. Free seeds. Come to the seed library. library. Absolutely. All right. Good night, everybody. Have a good night.